you have your Bible this morning, let me invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 is our text of Scripture as we continue our series called Life Lessons. We are looking at the parables of Jesus, selected parables that is, and this morning uh, I want us to talk about the wheat and the tares. And so Matthew chapter 13, you'll find that Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so we are in Matthew chapter 13 in verse 24, the Bible says these words, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No less while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this text of scripture. And Father, we pray that on this Lord's day that you would help us to understand what it is that you're communicating in this parable. Not only to understand, but Father, our prayer is that we would also obey. So help us to understand your scripture. Help us to obey it through your power. And Father, thank you today that we have the privilege to to hear your voice, to hear you speak to us. We pray, Lord, that we would say yes to you throughout this time together. It's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus told many parables. It was a way for him to communicate. It was a way for Jesus to describe what he was wanting his listeners to understand. It's been said many times that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus taught a lot of parables. They, they had earthly stories. They connected with the audience of that day. It didn't matter where they lived or, or what they were going through. If Jesus was speaking to a particular group, he made sure that he spoke on a topic that, that they well understood, and then he applied it to a kingdom thought. The purpose of parables is to help explain the meaning of Jesus' teaching. They help us to understand what the Son of God was communicating. And you will remember that Jesus' disciples uh, must have had uh, a lot of questions because he spoke in a lot of parables. In Matthew chapter 13, in verses 10 through 13, uh, you'll notice just prior to our text of Scripture this morning, that the Bible says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables." Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. As Jesus explained all of this to his disciples, he wanted them to know that the parables would allow the the light bulb, if you will, to go on in the hearts of men and women and students alike when it came to the principles of God. In his book, New Light on the Difficult Words of Jesus, David Bliven says parables such as those Jesus used were extremely prevalent among ancient Jewish teachers. And over 4,000 of them have survived in rabbinic literature. The rabbis of Jesus' day spent much of their time traveling throughout the country to communicate their teachings and interpretations of Scripture. And so we find that that when Jesus lived upon the earth, uh, most people spoke in parables. It was the, the way that they taught. It, it was the way that they helped people to, to understand. And I'm so glad that he, he did, aren't you? 
Because it's in this section of Scripture that Jesus gives us another kingdom lesson that would otherwise be difficult to understand if it were not for a parable form in which it was taught. He talks about four different groups. As you look here in in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and we consider the wheat and the tares. You'll notice he speaks of an enemy in our parable that sows bad seed, and this represents Satan. He speaks of a landowner who sows good seed, and this would represent God. He speaks of the wheat in this parable, and that refers to the children of God. That's you, that's me, if you have put your faith and your trust in Him. And he speaks of the tares. This would be the the children of Satan, those who have never yet put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus' purpose in the parable of the wheat and the tares was to show that not all people belong to Him and that in the end judgment, it will reveal those that are His and those who are not. You'll remember that He was speaking to a massive audience. When Jesus taught, there were crowds of people that came to, to hear Him teach. If, if you would have been alive during that day and time, I know if I would have been alive during that day and time, uh, I would have gone whatever distance to be able to hear the greatest teacher in all of the world from the very lips of Jesus teach on something that had to do with the kingdom. And so there were massive groups that came. Some of them wanted to hear him teach because they really wanted to follow him. Others had heard about him performing miracles, and so they were there for for the miracles. But you'll notice that it's here that, that he shares this parable among a large crowd of people regarding the wheat and the tares. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 1 and 2, the same chapter we are in this morning, the very first two verses, the Bible says on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood there on the shore. And so that's the background for this parable this morning. This is the context in which we find this particular parable that Jesus has these great multitudes who all gather together on this particular day. Jesus is in the boat. He sits down as a teacher would do during this custom in this particular era. And all of these people are on the shore ready to hear, ready to listen to his message. And as he looked into their eyes, uh, the people that stood on the bank, you'll notice that they were either a wheat or they were a tear. And Jesus wanted them to know that throughout the world, there are people who are blended together that belong to either God or Satan. We either belong to Almighty God or we belong to Satan. But eventually, in this parable, he teaches that they will be separated for all of eternity. I want you to notice some things, some some startling things, some sobering things as we look at this parable together today. The first thing I want you to notice is that our enemy is active. Our enemy is active here in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 24 and 25. The Bible says another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Jesus tells this parable about a farmer whose workers had prepared the ground. And they had planted the seed throughout his field. They had worked very hard. They had done a great job, and they had uh, done a lot of good things to get the ground ready. But you'll notice that that particular evening when they went to bed, that something happened. The man's enemy came, and he sowed tears. You'll notice here in verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. A tear was a type of weed that 
closely resembled wheat. It was very similar. It was almost impossible to be able to tell the difference between the two until the wheat would ripen and bear grain. In ancient times, that this was done out of spite or, or revenge by an enemy who wanted to destroy or greatly reduce the value of a, another man's crop. It was such an issue that it was a very common hate crime during the, the time of Jesus, and the Romans developed a special law against it. Our Lord shows the craftiness of Satan as he reveals his activities because he is the biggest, smartest coward because he knows when and how to strike. You see, he's referring to the greatest enemy of all in this parable in verse 25 when he says, His enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and he went his way. This enemy that Jesus is describing is not just an enemy that a farmer would have during this particular era. He is referring spiritually to the greatest enemy of all. And I want to remind you today about this enemy that we have, some of the facts that we know about Satan. I want you to remember today that he is a murderer. He, in, in John chapter 8, verse 44, the Bible says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Not only is he a murderer, but he is also a tempter. In Matthew chapter 4, we find Jesus in verse 1. And the Bible says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And you'll remember all of those different attempts that the enemy tried to make to get the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, to stumble. He is also a liar the greatest liar in all the world. In John chapter 8, verses 44 and 45, the Bible says, When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is the father of all lies. But not only is he a murderer and a tempter and a liar, but we would say today that he is active. Wouldn't you agree this morning? that he is active. In 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. devour. This lion who is active wants to literally take your life. He wants to take your home. He wants to take your marriage. He wants to take your children. He wants to take you. Jesus said it like this in John 10.10, 10, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. He has been planting for a long time the field that God initially created. Yet there will come a day when he will pay for all of his activity in the world. There will be a payday one day for this enemy. In Revelation chapter 20, in verse 10, the Bible says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. There will be a payday for this enemy that comes against God and his work. He will pay for the work that he did in God's field. There's a second thing I want you to notice today, and it's our response to him. Because here in our parable in Matthew chapter 13, you'll notice that there is a response from the people of God, from you and from me as well. Look what he says in Matthew 13 verse 26. The Bible says, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, Did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. The servants of the field 
could not believe that someone would come and destroy their field. They couldn't believe that, that someone would come and, and do these things, especially all of the work that, that they did in planting the seeds. They could never imagine going and, and doing this to someone else's field. And you'll notice that they were ready to go back to work to remove the tares from the wheat, but the owner chose to leave them in place. Can you imagine for a moment how much work it would have been to go back into the field and try to separate the wheat from the tares? You see, the owner knew that the more damage would be done to the good crop by pulling out the weeds one at a time. He knew this wasn't the right response. And the question this morning for us is this. What is our response to all of the tears in our world? What is our response to the, those who have never trusted Christ as their Savior? What is our response to the loss? Because I believe there's five ways that we ought to respond. I believe you'll agree with me this morning. And I think the first thing that we are to do is to love them like Jesus. When it comes to those who have yet to give their lives to Christ, there is a call upon the people of God to love the lost the way that Jesus loves them. We are to love them with the love that God has poured into our hearts. But secondly, I believe that we ought to shine our light so that they can see the difference that He makes. What the world is looking for are Christians who look like Christ. Not perfect Christians, but they're looking for Christians who have truly found something that is real, something that is lasting, something worth giving their lives towards. I want you to notice that we are to shine our light as brightly as possible so that they can see the difference that Christ has made in us. There's a third thing. It's to long for them to come to Christ. It starts with a burden. I believe that as God's people, we've lost our burden for the lost. We've lost our burden for people to come to Christ. No wonder many of our churches in America, for sure, don't see people come to Christ. We don't see people follow Christ in believers' baptism. We've lost our, our burden for Christ, uh, for, for them to come to Christ. It begins with us praying and asking God to give us that burden, a burden for them, a burden to share, a burden to tell about what Christ can do in their hearts. There's a fourth thing, that's to tell them about salvation. That God wants us to use our words. He wants us to tell them about what He has done in our lives. And to tell them what He did over 2,000 years ago when He left heaven and He came to earth. And He lived among men and eventually made His way to a cruel cross called Calvary. He gave His life on Golgotha. And then fifthly and finally, to pray for God to work in their hearts. Only God can save people. Only God can bring about that change. We can do all that we want to do, but ultimately it's God who has to touch their hearts and show them their greatest need is Christ and that He is willing to forgive them of all of their sins. It's been said the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. How true that is today. The reality is that God is much stronger than Satan. We would say today that Satan is mighty, but we would say that God is almighty. Amen? Even though the enemy has planted tares, God through His Son can make them wheat. Our job is not to decide who is wheat and who is a tear? Instead, our responsibility is to show and tell Jesus to everyone in the world. That's the call that God has placed in our lives. You see, our response to Him is to share, to show, to go, and so that people can find Christ as their Savior and Lord. 
years ago, there was a world-famous violinist who had earned a fortune with his concerts and his compositions. But he generously gave most of his fortune away. And so when he discovered a wonderful violin on one of his trips, he, he wasn't able to buy it. He didn't have enough money because he had given most of his money away. And so later, having raised enough money to meet the asking price, he returned to the seller, hoping to purchase the beautiful instrument. But to his great dismay, it had been sold to a collector. It was a little too late. And so he made his way to the new owner's home, and he offered to buy the violin. And the collector said it had been a prized possession, and he really didn't want to sell it. And so he was very disappointed. And he was about to leave, and then he had this grand idea. He asked the question, he said, before I leave, he said, could I play the instrument once more before it's given to silence? And so permission was granted. And the great musician filled the room with such heart-moving music that the collector's emotions were deeply stirred. And he said, I have no right to keep that to myself. He said, take it to the world and let the people hear it. You know, as I think about the gospel, as I think about the good news, what Jesus did on the cross and what he has done in your life and my life, I believe that in essence... He says the same thing to us. Take it into the world and let people hear it. We have an active role in people coming to Jesus. That Yes, it's God who convicts. And yes, it's God who saves. But have you noticed that the gospel shows us that He uses us in the process. That even though there are so many who are lost, we know that God can work in their lives. And the reason why we know that is because every time we look in the mirror, we are reminded of the grace and the power of God. We understand that God is always bigger. God is always greater. There's a third thing I want you to notice as we look at this text together this morning. And it's this. It's the reminder that eternity is near. Eternity is near. Look in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30 of our text. The Bible says, let both grow together until the harvest. And at, that, at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. They would go into the barn but you'll notice that the tares would be burned. The reality is that those who belong to Christ will spend eternity with Him in heaven. It's a great promise that we have throughout Scripture where God tells us about a place called heaven that we, we long for as Christians. What an awesome thing to know that, that when we leave this world that God is our Father. Jesus is our Savior. We've known that throughout this life. But also that heaven is our home. And throughout scripture, uh, we get a glimpse of what our eternal home will be like one day. But you'll notice the flip side of that coin, unfortunately, is that those who do not belong to Christ, they will spend an eternity in a place called hell. Do you realize that Jesus spoke about hell many times when he was on earth? Most scholars tell us that for every one time Jesus spoke about heaven, that he spoke about hell seven more times, that there is a seven to one ratio. And it's not because Jesus liked talking about hell, but it's because he did not want one person to ever go to a place like hell. Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher of yesteryear. Some say he was the prince of preachers. And it was Spurgeon who said, It is a very remarkable fact that no inspired preacher of whom we have any record ever uttered such terrible words concerning the destiny of the lost as our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the forerunner and wanting to make sure that no one ever went to a place called hell. That's the whole reason why he came to earth. In Matthew chapter 13, in verses 40 through 43, 
The Bible says, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How sad it is that real people go to a real hell. Some of them are at your work. Some of them are at your school. Some of them even live in your home. And others are at our church. There are all kinds of people that that meet together at school and at work and at home and at church. Can I remind us today that some are wheat and some are tares? As you look at our text once more in verse 30. Notice what Jesus says in this parable. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. That would be those who are lost. But gather the wheat, that would be the saved, into my born. Our Lord desires that no one would ever experience hell. That's why He left heaven and came to earth. Therefore, He came to earth and He died on the cross, not just for your sins and my sins, but listen, He died for the sins of the entire world. One of the greatest verses in all the Bible is John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 as well. Where the Scripture says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God sent His very best in the Lord Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago because eternity is near. And He wanted every single person to put their faith and their trust in Him to give their lives to the One who gave His life for them. The heart of the Savior was that no one would perish. Not one person And so may those who are lost know how much He loves them and the payment that He provided on the cross. May we do all that we can as Christians to show them the way that God has for them in the future. That is a life that is given to Christ. Now, I think there's some ways that we can live out this parable this morning as we close. And the first thing that I would say to to you is this, be smart, be smart, because the enemy is real. It's not from the the words of this pastor or the lips of this pastor or, or someone else. It's from the lips of Jesus. Be smart, because our enemy is real. Our enemy is active, and he is not more powerful than our God. God calls us to be smart. Wherever you are today, as you think about your life and your your interaction with other people, and as you live your life, may it be that you live a life that is very smart. Be smart. But there's a second thing, and it's this. Be Christ-like. Be Christ-like. What is one way that you can love a non-believer? What is one way that you can love someone that has never trusted Christ as their Savior, but even closer to home than that. Who is that one person that God has put in your life who is a non-believer that He wants you to love? You know who that is. God has put that one person at work. or God has put that one person at school, maybe in your classroom, maybe on your ball team. God has put that that one person in your home. It may be a spouse. It may be one of your children. God has put that one person at church who you are waiting to see come to faith in Christ. Who is your one? 
Who is your one person that, that you know that God has put within your circle of influence that he wants to use you to, to show them the best life in all the world? And that's the life that is lived for Jesus. How can you make a kingdom difference? How can God use you to make a difference in their life? What can you do today? Not tomorrow, but what can you do today? Be smart. Be Christ-like. There's a third thing I want to remind you of as we close, and it's this. Be intentional. Be intentional. Because you'll notice that lifestyle evangelism is important. The way that we live our lives is important. And yes, we can show this world the difference that Christ has made through what we call lifestyle evangelism. By the way that we live our lives, people will see that, yes, there's, there's something different about that person. And eventually, hopefully, they will learn that it's Christ in your life. Lifestyle evangelism is important, but listen to me, lip evangelism is vital. Because they can watch your life and leave this world without Christ and never know why you live the way that you do. Lip evangelism is vital. We must at some point not only live our lives for Christ, but we must share our testimony, what Christ has done for us and what he can do for them as well. Sharing our testimony and sharing the story, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God wants us to show and share Jesus because hell is a real place and so is heaven. And we want every person to go to a place called heaven to know that when they leave this world, that they know, that they know, that they know, that they belong to Him. Be smart. Be Christ-like. Be intentional as we live our lives in this world. May we bring as many people to faith in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for this day. Thank You for those who are watching this morning, listening to Your Word. Father, far greater than any words I could ever speak, is what your Holy Spirit has said to us on this Lord's Day. Lord, I pray for those who are watching this morning who have never invited Jesus to be their Savior. They know about Him. They respect Him. They believe in Him with their, with their minds. They, they know there was a historical Jesus who lived over 2,000 years ago who died on a cross. But Lord, this morning it's more than that. This morning they realize that they have never entered from darkness to light in asking Jesus to be their Savior and their Lord and their means of forgiveness. And I pray right now, right where they are, listening and watching to this message, that they would ask you to be their Savior. To forgive them of all the sins they've ever committed, which is an amazing thing for all of us. And to wash their sins with your precious blood, Lord, may they commit to give their lives to you as well. Not to be saved, but because they love you. May they know this morning, by asking Jesus to be their Savior, and meaning it with all of their hearts, that heaven is their home. That they can know that one day when they leave this world, that they will see you face to face. And Father, I pray for Christians today. What a reminder for us. That all around us are people who are hurting. People who are lost. And you're calling us to live our lives for you. And to open our mouths and share what you have done for us. And what you can do for them. Help us, Lord, to be very, very intentional. Help us to be Christ-like. Lord, help us to be smart. And Father, we love you. We pray for those this morning that have made a decision. We pray that they would connect with us, Lord, through our website. May we hear from them. May we know, Lord, what they're going through so that we can pray for them. We can reach out to them if desired and help them in their journey. Father, thank you for this time together. What an honor it has been to share your word on this Lord's Day. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.